uh, good it's afternoon here, morning in Oxford, and I'll be giving a short talk on how using uh, process mapping to understand uh, patient journeys through hospitals. So I'll give a brief introduction and then just give an example how to do the patient journey, talk briefly about the waste in healthcare, and then give a couple of examples from our current work. It's ongoing. So I'm just giving like preliminary findings. We're not done with analysis, but just to illustrate how we've used our, our patient journeys, process mapping to understand patient journeys, and then um, a summary. So by way of introduction, process mapping is a form of clinical audit, and it allows us to see the patient's experience by following the sequence of steps as they receive care. It helps to identify potential blind spots, bottlenecks, and other inefficiencies in the provision of care, with, and can help improve quality of care, increase efficiency, and improve overall patient satisfaction. And by way of interventions, can help redesign and streamline um, workflows. So there are various approaches used in uh, process mapping. Uh, you could have the option of a multidisciplinary meeting where you have around four to five um, clinical staff who are involved in provision of care, especially for the particular condition that you're studying. And then either have a single or short series of meetings, um, preferably in a non-clinical environment. The advantages of this is that you can get results in a defined time and then allows interaction because they can talk amongst each other, use post-its as, as they chat out the journey as they understand it. Now, this usually depends on their knowledge of the patient journey and um, there's an absence of direct observation. The other approach is uh, walking the journey. So following the normal route of the patient journey, having one-to-one -one patient and staff interviews in the clinical environment. And it allows a realistic assessment of the journey, particularly if you can do it several times and you have the direct observation where you can actually note uh, what's happening. So the effectiveness is influenced by the availability of staff time and even the researcher time because you, you actually have to be there in real time as things are happening and also dependent on how open the staff and patient are. And then, so there's that, the walking, um, the journey, and then there's direct observation whereby you follow a patient's journey in real time with direct observation and then informal chats with them as, as, as you observe what's going on. And this provides information from the patient's perspective on the journey. The other, the previous two, you're sort of getting the health worker um, perspectives. So this again is also time consuming and influenced by day-to-day -day variations in clinical environments and even the type of patient you select. So you make an assumption that what you're observing today is what would typically happen on, on other days. And then the final example is a patient self-reported experience where they sort of journal and record the experience of their journey in real time. And this represents their experience from their perspective. And this also depends on the type of patient you select and what the expectations are. And you may end up missing those who are probably too elderly, too sick, too frail, or maybe literate um, to be able to, to document their story. So ideally, how to map this journey? So you start by talking to the clinicians and patients, uh, if you're able to list the steps and activities involved in a particular treatment process as they understand it, and then go on to get more detailed information about the patient journey from the experiences. And with this information, you start to map out the different paths taken by the patients when they're in the system. And then the analysis is where now you sit down and carefully reflect, preferably with the staff if possible, on where potential gaps are and non-value steps. Not how many steps it takes uh, for a patient to get from one particular point to the end. Staff interactions, what's the time taken for each uh, step? That's the task time. And then what's the time between each step? That's the wait time. And how many times is the patient passed on from one person to another? That's the handoffs. And then what do patients and staff uh, complain about? So various ways that may be identified, maybe like prescription errors, inappropriate scheduling, 
distance between related departments in one of in one of our study hospitals we found the hospital is quite big that it depends on the relatives being able to drive from one department to another and those and often using taxi or border border and then waiting time by patients or staff inventory issues poor ergonomics over processing meaning there's so much paperwork to be done for simple tasks and then not making the most of staff skills. So all this should be at the back of your mind as, as you're trying to think through this channel. So I just have a, a couple of examples from actual patient journeys we've done. And we started off by interviewing healthcare workers who take care of critically ill patients and having them reflect, for example, from the time a patient arrives in the emergency department up to the time when they're either being referred or being admitted. So you can see the steps listed there. This particular activity had around 24 steps and you can see the bottlenecks they could identify, um, for example, like at registration and payment of registration fee, and then waiting for various things, waiting for radiology to be done, waiting for interpretation of results, then waiting to be reviewed by the doctor with results, then waiting for availability of bed space. So, and then asking the staff at that time to try and reflect how long each of these activities would take. And then um, this is an excerpt from a transcript that of an actual patient that our research assistant was able to follow from start to processing. This particular patient was an adult uh, female patient. She was brought in at the a and &E accompanied by two relatives in obvious pain and distress. So she was put in the bed and was being observed by a nurse and clinical officer. And the nurse went on to take the, the initial vital signs and uh, the oxygen saturation was around 93% and her heart rate was 90. And so you can see the person collecting the data was able to observe the uh, actual equipment that are there and the number of staff was there and the activities, um, uh, immediate activities that were being done like fixing an IV line. And then the clinician made a request for a blood test so the patient was in the bed. So that was 10, 20, so 20 minutes later, vital signs were repeated and they noted that the blood pressure was 93 out of 50. So this is low for an adult. And what the nurse did at that point was to start a, a drip of normal saline. The patient was still in the bed uh, with the fluids running. Remember a request for blood test has been done. Um, so the relatives have been told they need to go make payments for the blood sample to be done. So that seems to take a while. The fluids are running while the relatives are trying to go make the payments. So this is like uh, just over an hour since they arrived. So they come back later at 12.04. So that's like an hour and a half later, the sample is taken to the lab. Fluids are still running and the blood pressure is still low. And at this point, they also note that the patient is pale and they are waiting results from the lab. So a patient came at 10.20, so around 12.45, the medical officer who is slightly senior to the clinical officer now reviews the patient and decides that they need an, an ultrasound of the abdomen and the pelvis to determine why she could be in pain and distress. The fluids are still running and now the relatives have been told they need to go pay for the radiological tests. So, um, so the patient is being wheeled to the radiology department. Remember they came at 10.20, it's now around 1.14. She's accompanied by her relatives and they have to go through the same cycle again, now paying for the ultrasound to be done and they are waiting in a queue. Remember, she's accompanied by her relatives, not by clinical staff. When they eventually get seen nearly an hour later by the radiologist, they've paid, they're told the ultrasound can be done um, since the patient should have fasted before the test is done. So they go back to the outpatient department. This is nearly an hour later. And the doctor insists that the test is urgent and it needs to be done. So she 
gets wheeled back by her relatives to the radiology. Test has not been done. Radiologists say they want a clear communication from the agency, so they go back. Another hour has gone, so the doctor writes on the file that the test is urgent and it needs to be done as soon as possible. So they are wheeled back again, and the test still has not been done by 2.15. Remember, <coughs> so the doctor uh, makes a decision that don't do an abdominal pelvic, just do of the abdomen alone. So they go again to the radiology. It's now 2.25 and they are waiting for the now the abdominal ultrasound to the pelvic ultrasound to be done she's told she needs a full bladder so she has to drink water she's waiting it's now three o'clock she's still waiting 5 20 she's still waiting next in line remember in all this time there's no one who's checking her vitals again or replacing her fluids or checking her condition. She's just been waiting. So she gets there just close to six o'clock. That's when the ultrasound is done. And now she has to go back to casualty, waiting to be reviewed with the radiology. At this point, whoever has been observing has not seen much in the way of review because everyone is waiting for um, investigation results to be done. And the person observing left and did a follow-up call the next morning and found out that the patient eventually was admitted in the gynae ward around 10.30 and had a diagnosis of a ruptured ectopic pregnancy and had to go to theater for an urgent surgical intervention. So this just illustrates the back and forth and the circularity that patients have to go through often by themselves, needing relatives to navigate uh, the systems. And even though she was um, quite sick, she was pale, her vitals were deranged with low blood pressure. There was no ongoing monitoring and people were waiting to review her with, with results. So this just illustrates how you can quickly identify where these patients may actually um, deteriorate and even worse um, outcomes can happen. Um, yeah. And then this other chart just shows now when you sit down to start to visualize um, the processes and trying to identify decision making steps and and bottlenecks and 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 where unnecessary steps are. So that's where we're supposed to be proceeding to next before we try and, and come up with recommendations. So process maps uh, start ugly, but they're very practical. And they can end up as powerful communication tools. And like I said, there are various ways of doing them as long as you understand how and why. And they can be a great starting point for quality improvement. It's important to work together with the staff for ownership and accountability. They are easy to understand and they communicate clearing inefficiencies and they can help plan simple or low cost strategies like workflow redesign. So I'll stop there. And just a couple of references in case you're thinking about doing process mapping for yourselves for your work. Thanks, Asi.